Why do you want to be executed? I have to be. Uh, is that world again? Get ready to explore the darkest corners of the human mind as we take you through the conclusive interviews conducted with serial killers just before their executions. I'm sorry for the hurt that I've caused so many people. These final interviews uncover the raw truths that lie behind the heinous crimes they committed, shedding light on the complex motivations and psychological triggers that drove them to such extremes. Through the lens of empathy, inquiry, and rigorous examination, we invite you to accompany us on a journey inside the dark minds, revealing final confessions of serial killers before their execution. Carol Edward Cole in an exclusive televised conversation, a condemned individual famously referred to as Eddie Cole, born in Sioux City, Iowa, on May 9, 1938, reflects on his life, punishment, and the anguish he caused to his victims. The interview unfolds mere hours before his scheduled execution. As the dialogue commences, the interviewer probes Cole about the emotional strain he endures and whether he finds it increasingly challenging or easier to manage. Cole concedes that recent days have been emotionally exhausting, leaving him fatigued and worn. Nevertheless, he remains steadfast in his resolve and expresses no inclination to postpone his execution. When questioned about his remorse for the victims, Cole acknowledges his profound sorrow, particularly for an 11-year-old girl he murdered in 1967. He ponders the potential repercussions of his actions on her life, and concedes that even a prior five-year sentence failed to assuage his guilt. Though refraining from mentioning the victims by name, the interviewer inquires about the religious dimension of his circumstances. Cole regards it as a personal matter, but concedes its influence on his thoughts. The discussion shifts to concerns regarding potential pain during the execution process. Cole admits to apprehension, given that it marks the first implementation of this method in the state. He hopes for a comfortable and painless conclusion, yet the uncertainty engenders apprehension. When directly confronted about whether he believes he deserves to die, Cole finds it challenging to articulate a response. While acknowledging that his actions warrant the ultimate punishment, the question underscores the gravity of his crimes. He gained notoriety as an American serial killer responsible for the deaths of at least 15 women and one boy between 1947 and 1980. Cole's tumultuous upbringing was marred by his parents' strained relationship and his mother's extramarital affairs. His father's absence during World War II exposed Cole to his mother's infidelity, which she enforced through threats of silence. This tumult fueled torment at school, where Cole endured ridicule due to his feminine name. At the age of eight, Cole's suppressed anger culminated in the drowning of a classmate named Duane, initially deemed an accident, but later confessed to as a calculated act of retribution against his mother. As a teenager, Cole engaged in petty crimes, leading to arrests for drunkenness and theft. After a brief stint in the U.S. Army, he was discharged for stealing pistols. Cole's violent fantasies and fear of women led him to seek help from the police, confessing his disturbing thoughts. He spent time in mental hospitals, where doctors noted his inability to engage in sexual intercourse without harming women. Diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, he was released in 1963 and relocated to Dallas, Texas, where he married and later set fire to a motel due to suspicions of his wife's infidelity. His arson conviction resulted in a prison sentence, but upon release, Cole attempted to strangle an 11-year-old girl, leading to another prison term. Astonishingly, despite his homicidal inclinations, he was not detained when doctors decided against it, and he returned to San Diego. A series of gruesome murders marked Cole's adult life, with him justifying his actions by claiming his victims reminded him of his adulterous mother. His capture ensued after becoming a suspect in one murder and being found at the scene of another. During questioning, Cole confessed to all the murders, admitting to taking the lives of at least 14 women over the previous nine years. However, due to his intoxicated state during the crimes, he was unsure of the exact number. Cole was convicted of three of the murders he committed in Texas. He was sentenced to life at the Huntsville prison. In 1984, he agreed to face additional murder charges in Nevada, resulting in a death sentence. 
Despite efforts by anti-death penalty activists to commute his sentence, Cole resisted their attempts. On December 6, 1985, he was executed by lethal injection at Nada State Prison. Wesley Allen Dodd In 1989, a wave of horror swept across the nation as the details of Wesley Allen Dodd's depraved acts came to light. This is the chilling story of a man who preyed on innocent children, leaving a trail of shattered lives in his wake. Dodd's journey into darkness began in an environment far from nurturing. His unhappy childhood, marked by a troubling incident at the age of 13, cast a long shadow. Soon, he began targeting vulnerable young boys, abusing them under the guise of babysitting and exploiting opportunities presented by his daily life. Despite multiple brushes with law enforcement, lenient punishments further emboldened his actions. The Navy offered escape, but even their ranks couldn't contain his twisted desires. Discharged after offering money to young boys, Dodd continued his disturbing pattern, seeking help that ultimately proved ineffective. His diary, a disturbing manifestation of his inner demons, laid bare his plans for unimaginable acts of torture, abuse, and murder. Tragically, these plans turned into horrifying reality in 1989. Two young brothers, lured away in a park, became victims of Dodd's sadistic cruelty. Shortly after, another innocent life was snatched from a playground, subjected to unspeakable horrors before meeting a tragic end. Dodd's reign of terror finally came to an end when his attempt to abduct another child met resistance, leading to his capture. Confessions followed, revealing the extent of his crimes and the chilling certainty that he posed a continuing threat. His motives, as unsettling as his actions, painted a picture of a man convinced of his own darkness, unable and unwilling to resist his urges. In a twisted sense of justice, he saw his execution as a way to protect others, a final act to prevent further harm. Dodd's story, filled with disturbing details and unsettling revelations, leaves an indelible mark. His life, marred by both tragedy and monstrous choices, serves as a stark reminder of the devastating impact of child abuse and the importance of vigilance in protecting the vulnerable. Even in the face of his execution, the questions linger. What compels someone to such darkness? And can true redemption ever be found? While his pamphlet aimed to educate children, doubts clouded its sincerity. Velma Bullard Born into a financially strapped family, Margie, formerly Bullard Velma, began noticing the stark difference between her life and her classmates. To afford small treats, she resorted to taking small sums from her father. However, this youthful crime ended abruptly with his stern punishment. Her adolescence was marred by a dark secret her own father's abuse, pushing her to escape at a young age. At 17, she married her high school sweetheart, Thomas, and had two children. Despite starting work at a textile factory, medical issues forced her to leave. A necessary surgery, coupled with her husband's increasing reliance on alcohol, left her feeling isolated. Seeking solace, she turned to prescription drugs, hopping from doctor to doctor for refills. A heated argument led to her leaving with her children, tragically followed by a mysterious fire that claimed her husband's life and destroyed their home. Back with her parents, tragedy struck again when her mother fell ill. Neglected due to Margie's new job as a caretaker, suspicion arose as individuals under her care became inexplicably ill and perished. During this time, she married widower Jennings, who also met a mysterious demise via a heart attack. The cycle continued with her father succumbing to cancer, unrelated to her caretaking role. Despite seemingly moving on, whispers followed as more clients under her care fell ill and died. A new boyfriend, suspicious of her actions, discovered stolen items and forged checks before passing away in an unexplained manner. This triggered an investigation, with autopsies revealing traces of a deadly poison in his system. Further investigation unearthed the same poison in the bodies of her previous victims, leading to confessions and a death sentence. Despite arguments from experts citing psychological issues, she was condemned, becoming the first woman executed after the reinstatement of capital punishment. Throughout the trial, her age, gentle demeanor, and soft Southern accent 
stood in stark contrast to the chilling reality of her crimes. Victims, including her mother, boyfriend, and others, were all found to have been poisoned with the same lethal substance hidden in food or drinks. Driven by financial struggles and fueled by a growing addiction, Margie resorted to theft and ultimately murder. The defense argued she never intended to kill, merely keeping them ill until she could repay the stolen money and earn their gratitude by caring for them back to health. However, the prosecution countered that she actively concealed the true cause of their illnesses, hindering potential life-saving interventions. Despite remorse and public displays of grief, her sentence stood. The local prosecutor, known for his harsh stance, played a key role in securing her conviction. Her appeals gained traction due to her unique combination of gender, age, religious conversion in prison, and expressed remorse. Before her execution, she was initially held in a women's facility, but later moved due to security concerns. Confined in near isolation near the execution chamber, she reflected on her life, attributing her downfall to drug addiction. Describing the past decade as a drug-induced haze, she acknowledged a loss of control over her actions. Though prevented from discussing her state of mind during the crimes, she found solace in newfound faith, crediting it for her strength during incarceration. Drug-free and filled with regret, she expressed deep remorse for the pain she caused, yearning to undo the harm inflicted. Facing her impending fate, she sought solace in faith and strived for redemption. In the end, she was executed by lethal injection, leaving behind a complex legacy as the first woman executed in decades. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. In the shadowy recesses of humanity's psyche lies a chilling realm where the minds of serial killers dwell. These enigmatic figures, whose deeds have shaken the very fabric of society, often harbor secrets and stories that defy comprehension. As they stand on the precipice of their final moments, facing the inexorable fate of execution, the world holds its breath, eager to glimpse the inner workings of their twisted minds. As we journey inside the dark minds to witness final confessions of serial killers before execution, we are compelled to confront our own humanity, grappling with questions that transcend the boundaries of morality and understanding. What drives an individual to commit unspeakable acts of violence? Can we ever truly comprehend the depths of human depravity? What should be done to prevent these acts to protect our society? And in the face of such darkness, is redemption still possible? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. Theodore Robert Bundy On the 24th of November, 1946, Theodore Robert Bundy, widely known as Ted Bundy, was born in Burlington, Vermont. He would later emerge as one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. Despite his charismatic demeanor and intelligence in his youth, signs of Bundy's sadistic inclinations began to emerge during his teenage years in Washington. By 1972, Bundy had completed his college education and seemed destined for a bright future in either law or politics. However, it was in 1974 when his proclivity for violence manifested as he brutally assaulted his first confirmed victim. Bundy meticulously targeted young, attractive college women near his residence in Washington and later in states such as Utah, Colorado, and Florida. He employed various deceptive strategies to ensnare them, often disguising himself with casts on his limbs or feigning disability with crutches. By leveraging his charm and deceit, he coerced his victims into assisting him before launching his heinous attacks. Using a 1968 tan Volkswagen Beetle, Bundy would abruptly strike his unsuspecting victims on the head with a crowbar or pipe, rendering them powerless. He then confined them within the vehicle, even removing the passenger seat to create a concealed space where victims could remain undetected. Bundy's atrocities extended to unspeakable acts of rape and murder often employing methods like strangulation or brutal bludgeoning. He also engaged in the horrific practice of mutilating their bodies, sometimes displaying victims' severed heads as grim trophies in his apartment. By leaving minimal evidence and exploiting the limited forensic techniques of the 1970s, Bundy evaded detection for an extensive period. Bundy's initial apprehension occurred in Utah on August 16, 1975, after a daring escape attempt. 
He subsequently resumed his cycle of violence in Florida, primarily targeting Florida State University students. However, Bundy's crimes eventually caught up with him when he was pulled over for a minor traffic violation on February 15, 1978. In the final hours before his scheduled execution, Ted Bundy expressed a desire to reflect on his life and emphasized the importance of living in the present. Reflecting on his past, Bundy acknowledged exposure to explicit content, including pornography, during his adolescent years. He described how this exposure fueled his fantasies and eroded barriers that restrained him from acting upon his destructive impulses. Despite grappling with guilt and remorse, Bundy accepted responsibility for his actions and emphasized the detrimental effects of pornography on vulnerable individuals. In his final moments, Bundy found solace in his faith in Jesus Christ, acknowledging the shared experience of death that awaits us all. His execution in the electric chair on January 24, 1989, marked the end of a reign of terror characterized by manipulation and deceit. Throughout his criminal life, Bundy possessed an uncanny ability to manipulate those around him, maintaining a deceptive facade while engaging in despicable acts that earned him the infamous title of Heartless Evil Incarnate. His case continues to captivate public attention, serving as a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity and the importance of vigilance against such horrors in society. Aileen Carol Waros In 1991, Aileen Carol Waros emerged as a groundbreaking figure, shattering the widely held myth about serial killers. Until then, notorious individuals such as Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy had established a stereotype of the typical serial killer, white, male, and primarily motivated by sexual dysfunction. However, Waros defied these preconceived notions by proving that gender and race are not defining factors when it comes to serial murder. The media quickly dubbed her America's first female serial killer, sensationalizing her story. Nevertheless, even Robert K. Wessler, a renowned FBI profiler who coined the term serial killer and identified patterns in this type of crime, regarded Waros as an anomaly in the field. While it is true that women do commit multiple murders on occasion, their actions tend to be more impulsive and unplanned instead of following a sequential pattern like men. Sadly, though unsurprisingly, one aspect of Waros's life aligns with her male counterparts. She too experienced severe abuse and violence during her childhood, similar to the experiences of Henry Lee Lucas and Richard Ramirez, among others before her. Finding herself trapped in the cracks of support systems, she turned to a life of wrongdoing fueled by hopelessness and rage. Born on February 29, 1956 in Rochester, Michigan, Waro spent her formative years under the misconception that her grandparents were her biological parents. In actuality, they had adopted both Waro's and her brother Keith at a young age. Aileen's mother, Diane, entered into marriage but quickly initiated divorce mere moments after giving birth to Waro's. Subsequently, Diane remarried and had two more children while Waro's and her brother were raised by their grandparents. Life in Waro's grandparents' home was far from easy. Lori Waro's, her grandfather, was an alcoholic who subjected her to frequent beatings and abuse. Aileen endured physical and emotional trauma, including allegations of sexual abuse by her grandfather. These experiences led her down a destructive path, and by the age of 12, she was trading sex for money and cigarettes. At 15, Waros left home and became a homeless sex worker, relying on theft and illegal activities to survive. Over time, her criminal behavior escalated, and she was involved in various offenses such as burglary and assault. She adopted different aliases to cover her tracks. In 1989 and 1990, Waros committed a series of murders targeting men she claimed had solicited her for sex and then attempted to rape her. She killed seven men, leaving a trail of bodies across Florida. Waros's self-defense claims were met with skepticism, and she was convicted of six counts of murder despite her pleas and assertions of abuse. She received six death sentences. During her time on death row, Waros exhibited signs of paranoia and maintained a conflicted stance regarding her crimes. She participated in an interview before her impending execution. Her words provide a glimpse into her troubled mindset and the circumstances surrounding her crimes. Considering the gravity of her situation, 
Waros seemed remarkably composed as she discussed her preparation for the following morning, acknowledging her sloppiness and lack of professionalism as a murderer. Waros claimed that law enforcement knew her true identity after the death of Richard Mallory, the first victim. She believed that the police covered up her initial crimes and allowed her to continue killing, inadvertently turning her into a serial killer. She claimed to have left fingerprints at the crime scenes, but the authorities failed to apprehend her, leading to additional victims. Waros then shared disturbing details about her time in prison, alleging torture and psychological torment. She claimed that the prison staff used sonic pressure on her head and manipulated surveillance equipment to hinder her communication. Waros suspected the existence of hidden devices that affected her thoughts and writing, leading her to question her sanity. She also described mistreatment by prison officials, including increased harassment, inedible food, and suppression of her complaints and grievances. Waros believed that the authorities intentionally sought to portray her as mentally unstable to discredit her claims and ultimately drive her to madness. Waros maintained her faith in a higher power despite her suffering, expressing confidence that God, Jesus Christ, and the beyond would welcome her. She speculated about a transcendental experience, likening it to the beaming technology depicted in Star Trek, suggesting that she would journey to another planet or dimension. Waros firmly believed her actions were justified, asserting she had saved many people from harm. When questioned about her motives and whether her killings were in self-defense, Waros declined to delve into the specifics of her cases. She emphasized that her execution was imminent, leaving little room for further discussion or potential exoneration. She exhibited a resigned acceptance of her fate, leaving the interviewer to draw their conclusions. Waros expressed anger throughout the interview toward law enforcement, society, and the justice system. She accused them of sabotaging her life, denying her a fair trial, and exploiting her story for profit. In her final words, she expressed a sense of profound betrayal and criticized society's lack of compassion. On October 9, 2002, Waros was executed by lethal injection at the age of 46. John Wayne Gacy In December of 1978, the world was shaken when law enforcement unearthed the remains of 29 young boys from John Wayne Gacy's residence in Chicago, with an additional four bodies discovered in a nearby river. John Wayne Gacy's name stands out among the most infamous serial killers. By the time Gacy's reign of terror concluded, he had been convicted of 33 counts of murder in 1980 and sentenced to death. Gacy's murderous spree commenced long before his apprehension. In a haunting interview with CBS 2's Walter Jacobson in 1992, a mere two years before facing execution, Gacy endeavored to portray himself as a misunderstood victim of circumstance. Throughout this groundbreaking interview, he tackled the misconceptions and false narratives that surrounded him. Gacy vehemently denied being a homosexual thrill killer, asserting that he had consistently been misquoted and misunderstood. While he admitted to consensual sex with men, he identified as bisexual and advocated for personal freedom, dismissing portrayals of him as a monstrous figure. Gacy criticized the media for sensationalism and underscored his strained relationship with his conservative father, suggesting it influenced his liberal views. He maintained his innocence, pointing to flaws in the investigation that led to his wrongful conviction. Expressing frustration with society's reluctance to seek the truth, Gacy cautioned against the dangers of embracing falsehoods and the potential for executing innocent individuals. Concerning his role as a father, Gacy depicted himself as loving and caring, rejecting physical punishment and emphasizing the importance of demonstrating love to children without spoiling them. He addressed accusations of murdering 33 children, explaining his work as a clown named Pogo and his association with an ice cream company boasting 33 flavors. Gacy acknowledged using clowning as a means to relax and mask his true identity and crimes. Even on death row, Gacy meticulously documented his daily life and the activities of his victims, perplexing many with his dual life as both a respected community member and a sadistic killer. He faced execution on May 10, 1994, defiantly uttering kiss my ass as his final words. Decades later, efforts to identify Gacy's victims persist, 
aided by advancements in DNA testing technology. Lingering questions persist regarding the true extent of his crimes and the potential involvement of accomplices, as Gacy hinted at additional victims, though concrete evidence remains elusive. In October 2021, another victim, Francis Wayne Alexander, was identified, likely killed by Gacy between 1976 and 1977. The ongoing endeavor to identify his victims continues, fueled by advancements in DNA testing technology. The complete scope of Gacy's crimes may never be fully unveiled. Lingering questions and unresolved cases ponder whether he acted alone or had accomplices. Gacy suggested the possibility of additional victims, but tangible evidence has yet to surface. The complexities of Gacy's case continue to intrigue and haunt the public consciousness, challenging our understanding of human psychology and criminal behavior. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.